Are you ready to bring your real estate game to the next level? My name is James Prendamano. I'm the CEO and founder of Pre-Real. And over the past 25 years, I've closed over a billion dollars in transactional real estate. Each week, I'm meeting with outstanding investors, high-performing individuals, and visionaries operating in the real estate space. These are the people that are actually out there in the real estate game right now getting it done. This podcast aims at bringing anyone's game to the next level. This is the Pre-Real Podcast. Welcome everyone to the show. We're joined today by Raphael Cortez. Uh, Raphael is the CEO of the Pulse Group. Uh, Raphael is one of these incredibly high energy entrepreneurs uh, that seems to have this drive that from a very, very young age has absolutely been out there killing it. And and by the tender age of 23, seemed to have accomplished more than most people accomplish in a lifetime. So Raphael, thank you so much for joining us today. James, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so this is the remix, folks. We, <laughs> we had, uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, our Macs or, or the batteries are melting down. I don't know if anyone else is experiencing that out there, but we got everything teed up. The, it crashed and we had to reboot. So we're going to redo part one here. So, Raph. Twice you, the fun. Yeah, twice right. The fun. The, 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 <laughs> this is uh, not norm, but why not? Let's get a little extra time together. So you, you're born and raised uh, in Yuma, Arizona. Um, and you're described as a, a second generation entrepreneur. C- can you just speak to the audience about what you mean there? Uh, yeah, so uh, I was raised by, by a single mom and um, this is a border town. So I actually grew up in a border town, which is San Luis, it's a little bit further south of Yuma, um, but nobody knows that town. Everybody just kind of connects Yuma, right? Anyway, so it's a border town. Um, she was a single or she is a, a she, she raised me as a single mom and, and she set up her shop. So she had a mom and pop like little grocery store in Mexico. Uh, so when I grew up, I, I grew up thinking that owning your own thing was a that was a norm. That was a regular thing to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's why I, I feel like a lot of stuff that I'm doing, the curiosity that I have and the drive that I have and, and whatnot, it's really adopted from from um, the stuff that I saw growing up. I mean, she would, you know, kind of do whatever she wanted with her schedule because she had, uh, you know, my aunts working in the same, uh, you know, grocery store and whatnot. And and uh, she she got to the point where she owned her options right at her in her little you know sphere. Um, and again, I thought that was the normal thing. So it, uh, one way or another, you know, you, you, you get conditioned, right. To, to think a certain way as you're growing up. And I think that's, that was a big, big factor. Yeah. So, uh, also, a, a, a product of a single mom, um, uh, it imprinted on me at a very, very early age that if you worked all hours of the day and you were kind of always on call, that was, as you had said, that's just the norm, right? This becomes right. part of of the DNA and and how we operate. So uh, at the age of 14, you got your first job at a locally local grocery store. And and as I've already learned, that wasn't mom's grocery store. You went out and got got the job at a separate grocer, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, at that point, um, she was... um... Uh, she had already sold the grocery store and we we're doing something, you know, some other stuff. Uh, and I, I just went out there and got a job as a the produce kid, but I was 14 years old. And, and I remember uh, it was really kind of like the first thing that exposed me to the real world because every Tuesday they would have these massive produce sales. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had to perform like I had, to, they didn't care. I was 14 years old. I had to come in and then keep the stuff clean, keep it stocked and then, uh, do the thing when they were having, you know, massive, massive sales. So there was a lot of traffic on those days. Um, and when I went in, when I started working for that, uh, company, there was a manager, the produce manager was there two weeks later, the guy quits and they just left me by myself. So I was, <laughs> I was running the thing, uh, for a good six, eight months, um, and I mean, that, that was interesting. It was interesting. Now, <laughs> did, did you recall having a, a real sense of pride in doing this at that age? You, you know what? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I remember thinking and feeling really good uh, every time, you know, that I crushed it. Like, okay, cool. Yeah, this is on point. This is my area. Like, this is my kingdom, um, you know, where all the bananas go and all that stuff. You know, it's my it's my responsibility, right? It was like the first time that I really kind of assumed the responsibility of something. Um, so, I mean, 
it, it is it's produce in the grand scheme of things, right? It's just a, a section of the store. Uh, but to me, I mean, it, it meant something big, right? I had a responsibility for that lady that was walking into the store. Um, and I don't know, it, it, I think we, again, going back to to uh, mom having that shop, it, it's customer service was always, you know, at, at the top of the priorities and, and I just carried on and, and I got to use it there, right? And then I mean, long story short, how you do one thing is how you do everything. But um, those behaviors and those habits really get ingrained in you and you grow up doing bigger things just in the same format. So do you think that can be taught? Absolutely. Absolutely. You do. Yeah, I do. I, I think uh, there's a, I mean, we, we have, we're a combination, right? We're a combination of natural behaviors. And, and learn behaviors or borrow behaviors. So then you probably heard me classical conditioning, right? That stuff that we are exposed to is stuff that we adopt and we start to uh, model our behaviors uh, and habits after that kind of stuff. Um, now, with that being said, if you're around a, an environment where you know, nobody's producing, it doesn't matter if you're the smartest tool in the shed, uh, nothing's gonna happen. There's gotta be a combination of the two, right? Um, and on the opposite side of the token to kind of, you know, address your question, I think that if you put yourself in a space where you're surrounded by people who are producing, where you're surrounded by people who are thinking bigger than you are, uh, where you're surrounded by doers and people who are actually taking action, you, that's going to rub off on you. So it's, it's totally something that can be learned. Um, and, um, better, better, even it, it's, it's, uh, it can be, you can borrow motivation from somebody else. Um, if you if you just put yourself in that you know type of space, so uh, uh, and I want to take a deep yeah. dive into this after we we catch up on the history. But you're an or organizational psychologist and you do coaching, uh, which for us has had a profound effect on everything that we do. And I really want to take a, a deep dive into what an organizational psychologist does and and how you're able to, to reach in and untap some of that potential. We have found uh, more times than not, uh, and many of the, the, I think the external factors have a, a lot to do with it, but uh, people seem to, people change and people grow, but you can't change the stripes. You know, uh, we mm -hmm. have found at least that uh, more times than not, um, one of the great disappointments for me in life, really a, a real disappointment was I, I used to look up to my elders and I, I just mm -hmm. assumed that there was this profound wisdom that came with, uh, with getting older and, and becoming an adult. And we found that that is just not the case. Uh, a, a lot of the, the folks that uh, we came up with that had certain behaviors at an early age uh, were unable to or unwilling to uh, explore, you know, themselves and unlock and change some of those behaviors. So I'm really interested to, to dive into how you're doing that and, and the benefits from it. But before we get there, I want the audience to understand, okay, it's not just a kid who got a job at 14. Uh, from 15 to 18, you had a bunch of jobs, right? You, you, you were kind of running around hard labor, uh, construction, supervisory positions in retail, you, you ran quite the gamut here. Yeah, it, it was an interesting time. I mean, I, and again, I, I feel lucky that I was, uh, uh, I was able to put myself in and around people who were doing bigger things. Right. So I, I, I was thinking, or I was, I was conditioned to think like, like an older kid, uh, not a 14 year old kid. All my friends were like the people who I was actually hanging out with uh, were, you know, 17, 18 year old kids. Um, I, I was a police explorer. I, I became a police explorer, which is kind of like the Boy Scouts, but for the police department. And that uh, the average age in that group was 18 years old. So that's the, you know, the, uh, the people who I spent most of my time with, right? You have 18 year old kids and then you have cops. Uh, and then when you're done with that, you go to school. And after that, you go to work. And it was just kind of, it became a routine, but I, I got exposed to just different ways of um or different interests you know very early on and um and yeah from that i i uh i spent a few years in the police explorers and and had a lot of fun there and and ended up uh being a becoming a fireman <laughs> and, and you were the youngest is it true you were the youngest firefighter in yuma county yeah. ever yeah well i mean not ever i'm sure there's somebody else you know but at that point i was the youngest uh firefighter there i mean i literally turned 19 um and uh, on my birthday that's you know i was working there when i turned 19 i was i was a fireman in 
wow in, in yuma and um and yeah, it was it was interesting because I would show up to uh, fire, you know, to the fire scenes and EMS scenes and whatnot. And people would look at this 19 year old kid like, are you taking my vital? Like, what are you doing? Where's your dad? Uh, so, <laughs> so it was just, you know, an interesting experience. But again, just putting myself in, in, in the path um, of of just people who knew more than than I did uh, putting myself in the path like for example captains loved me because I was I was always asking questions and and you know I think if I were to say that I have a virtue it's curiosity it's 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 yeah I mean I I work a lot I mean I, I know a thousand guys that can work just as hard uh, as I do right um, but I think curiosity has been one thing that's led me uh, to, to the experiences that I've been able to have. It's just, I'm just curious about things. Like, I wonder how that works. I wonder how this conversation can go. I, I wonder what else can be done here. And, and what if, what if that, what if question and, and the, being inquisitive about stuff, I think it's one of the things that has really positioned me, um, it just in the path of things and then taking action. Right. <laughs> so, uh, while you were uh, with the fire department, any close calls or any kind of profound experiences? Oh Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I had a, I had a few. Um, uh, one time, I had a roof on on my head. I had the the helmet actually. Is it? It's here. Let me let me pull it up. Give me a second. Yeah, sure. Oh wow! Right there, there's a crack on the back of this helmet uh, from a uh, from a roof. It just wow. landed on the on the back of my. Uh, my head. It took me out. Um, I, I was, I was out for a little bit. I mean, it wasn't one of those, uh, you know, near death experiences, I think, but it, I mean, it was scary. Definitely scary. I was 19 years old. I passed out and, you know, a few minutes later I woke up, but it was during a fire ground, uh, uh, scene and it was interesting, but you know, one thing that you do uh, learn is to appreciate stuff. Uh, you see a lot of stuff. I mean, more than, than the stuff that happens uh, to us, as individuals in the firehouse, right? We, we, we get exposed to a lot of things. We get ex exposed to a lot of tragedies. We get exposed to a lot of accidents, people losing everything in a matter of an afternoon. And it's, I mean, it really is impossible not to, you know, put yourself in, in, the, um, in, in the gratitude space. I mean, you walk away from that as like, wow, I, got, I have a car, I have a home to go to tonight, didn't burn down. Um, man, yeah. this person just died on that scene. I mean, they, they were going to lunch and they passed. Uh, so stuff like that. And it really hits you, right? Especially, I mean, I think um, when, when you're seeing that stuff uh, on a, I mean, regular basis, really, uh, it's, it makes you grateful. Like it helps you become more grateful about the stuff that you have, the opportunities that you have, uh, the people around you. Um, and it's, it's a thing of beauty at the end of the day. <laughs> perspective really brother yeah absolutely perspective, perspective. yeah so uh, at 21 you you began your first i guess the official entrepreneurial project right yeah um i uh so i launched it i launched it when i was 21 i started building the business plan when i was or putting together a business plan when i was around 20 uh, but it's a non-emergency medical transportation business. It's a long title, but basically what it is, it's a wheelchair and stretcher patient, uh, on, not emergency patient uh, transport uh, system. So we would take people to and from medical appointments, uh, doctor's visits, dialysis, and that kind of stuff. But they need either a wheelchair or stretcher, right? And uh, they used to um, take a, uh, uh, a unit, an actual ambulance out of service to go do that. So you're taking an emergency vehicle, it's gonna cost you know, thousands of dollars to your taxpayers uh, just to take it out of service for an hour when it's not something that's an emergency. And you have your, your crew out, your vehicle out. Um, so I started seeing that gap in Yuma, and, but the market wasn't big enough. So I moved um, a, a couple of, I started working my you know, just relationships and building that kind of stuff here in Phoenix. I'm in Phoenix now. Um, and I launched the business, I actually launched it in, uh, in Phoenix instead of Yuma. So was that uh, idea born out of your experiences in the fire department or was this separate path completely? I, I can't take full credit. I was uh, honestly, I was having a beer with one of my captains uh, and uh, we we're, we we're talking is like, we have 20, um, you know, 24 hours every other day. Uh, and 
<laughs> there's something that can be done, right? Like a lot of firefighters have a contractor's license and they have a side hustle. They have a, you know, that side gig. Um, and it's just, you know, what we do because we have a day on, day off, day on, day off. And then you get a Kelly days, which are four days consecutive of just not working, right? So like, there's got to be something that, that uh, you know, can be done there. And, uh, and we started uh, talking. He's like, I'm going to set up a mortuary. Um, you know, we started, you know, kind of bouncing around ideas. And he says, uh, you know what other business would be good? And he goes, uh, uh, a medical transportation business. So uh, fast forward, you know, a few years and, and he's, he owns two mortuaries in, in uh, funeral homes in, in Yuma. Um, and I, I built that company. I sold that company already, but um, I had it for 10 years. So, I mean, wow. it was a very productive meeting. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. That's a hell of a beer. Yeah, it's a hell of a beer. So uh, how do you make the jump from medical transport to real estate and, and several derivative uh, operations? You, you've got uh, several organizations underneath the Pulse Group. Uh, where, where does that connection come in? So um, I, I launched, I, I got my first paid client. So when I launched, I started working on the business, like I said, and putting it all together. But I got my first paid client in 2007. Um, and that's when I, you know, jumped into the transportation industry. Uh, I, I did well. I landed a couple of contracts with, uh, with the government and, and uh, I grew the company. So uh, by 2009, I had some cash just, you know, built from that and I wanted to place it somewhere. Uh, I don't know a thing about real estate. Um, I mean, I've heard, you know, that you come in and then fix. All I knew about real estate was the construction work that I had done prior. Uh, which was framing houses and then dropping concrete and that kind of stuff. I didn't know how any, any of it worked. Uh, so 2009, I was like, you know what, I'm going to do a flip. I can, you know, I can swing a hammer. Let's, let's just go ahead and take on my first flip. Um, and, and the business started running, right? So it was, I mean, I had dispatchers, I had drivers. Um, I, had, I already had a, a, you know, a, good, a good solid you know, size fleet at that point. Um, so I had some time on my hands to just do something else. And I went into real estate, did a couple of flips. Um, and yeah, so 2009, 2010, uh, the prices were crazy. Uh, 2011, even you could buy properties for a fraction, like 10% of what you can buy them right now. Um, so I did a few of those and then I came across uh, wholesaling. Um, and uh, I mean, that just made a, a ton of sense. To me, it made a ton. I, I didn't really like dealing with, I was already dealing with enough people in the trans transportation business, you know, drivers and mechanics and people in the, in the team. Uh, and then dealing with, uh, you know, contractors and subs and, and handyman and whatnot. It was like, it was becoming heavy, right? And then I came across wholesaling. I was like, wait, you can do, uh, you can sell your vested interest in the property and, and you, I don't have to, I can make a profit and I don't have to worry about, you know, swinging hammers or any of that stuff. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I just, I, I took that as my, uh, my big MO <laughs> and, uh, and I've been you know, doing wholesaling and I still flip. So we cherry pick flips, but we mainly focus on, on wholesaling. So, okay. Uh, can, can you walk the audience through what is wholesaling with, it's like uh, the buzzword, right? We hear now mm. everybody's wholesaling. What exactly is wholesaling? So, so wholesaling, it's uh, when you, when you find a property from a distressed seller, there's got to be some type of distress. There's a problem that's in place, right? Um, you find a property and you buy it. You have to buy it under, um, at a discount. You, so you buy it at a big discount and then you take that contract. Now you have a signed contract with the seller and you take that contract and you sell the contract to uh, a cash buyer. Somebody who's going to come in and actually flip it, right? But there's, in between that, um, there's a, there's a, there's a, a space for, for profit. Uh, which is an assignment fee. So you take that assignment fee. Uh, let's say for the sake of numbers that you find a property that's worth a hundred thousand uh, in the market, right? And then you go to a seller, need some rehab, a little bit of work here and there and whatnot. Um, and you buy it for 60,000. You sell that contract to somebody who's going to come in and fix it. Uh, but you sell it, uh, you sell it to them for 70,000 and you keep that spread of 10,000 for yourself. So it's, uh, you're not selling the actual property. That's the, the technicality of it. You're selling your vested interest in that contract. And then the new buyer is actually executing on the contract and closing. Exactly. So you use their money to close on that transaction. It's not a, if you do an assignment, you're not putting any money out of your pocket. Um, it's, it's low entry to barrier. You just got to know how to do it. Right. Uh, so it doesn't require a lot of, uh, of 
capital to, to get going on that. And once you have a good system in place, you can, um, I mean, you can really create a, a machine that's pumping out leads, pumping out sellers. Uh, if you become really good at negotiating, uh, which is what I dove head first um, uh, into in 2013, uh, it, I mean, it really makes a, a big, big impact on, on the results that you get. So. Sure. So the uh, in, in a very few sentences there, you described what, what I know, just being intimately involved in the business, is an extraordinarily complex accomplishment, right? To, to put together a, a system that is finding the opportunities, generating those leads, giving you the chance to go in and close those leads, making sure that you have the right contracts with the right language in it. And then you've got to work the other side of it. And you've got to find the counterpart that's willing to come in and step into your shoes, replace your deposit, and that they've got the right language in the contract so they can go execute on it. Right. How, how did you build an infrastructure like this without having significant experience in the market? Well, I, I, I mean, I went to YouTube University. I started listening to podcasts. And I mean, I, again, I get curious about something and, and I get obsessed almost you know, to a point. Um, so I did that at the beginning. I actually started listening to, uh, to Sean Terry's uh, podcast, Flip to Freedom podcast, and I think it was 2012. Um, and, and I kept like, when I bought, when I was buying homes for, for fix and flip, I, I kept seeing assignment fees. I never questioned it. I mean, I, I didn't know what it was like, all right, just sell me the house. That's my price. That's, you know, and I kept seeing assignment fees, assignment fees. And, 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 uh, later I find out that, you know, there's a middleman from the seller to me. Right. And they're making that assignment fee. Uh, and I mean, a lot of times there were, those were big fat assignment fees. You're talking 20, 20, uh, 15, $20,000 markups. Um, and, um, long story short, I, 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 um, I go to a, I want to get better and I go to a, um, a real estate uh, seminar, a rich dad, poor dad seminar. And they, they talk about wholesaling for about maybe 20 minutes. They really dive deep into it or they kind of mentioned it, but it was just enough for me to get, you know, interested. Right. So what do I do after that? I, um, I leave, I start looking into it. That's when I come across all the podcasts and, um, I closed, I closed, I think, two or three deals, um, uh, wholesale deals uh, after that. And it took me a couple of months, but uh, I signed up on everybody's uh, email list, right, for properties. And, and I get an email and it's coming from Sean Terry. Uh, it's, I'm on his mailing list and he's looking for an acquisitions rep in Maricopa County. I was like, wait, I'm in Maricopa County. Um, and at that point, I was kind of done with the transportation business. I wanted to sell it and I was still doing both things. Um, so I, I, I'm thinking like, okay, I want to dive into this. I, I want to cut the learning curve. Um, and if I can do it by going to work somewhere where I can get, you know, you know, trial by fire and really learn from the best. I mean, that's what, you know, that's what's going to happen. And, and yeah, I met, I met with him. Um, he brought me on on the spot. I uh, ended up selling my company, a transportation business. I sold it a few months later uh, and I, I started running acquisitions. So I went from being my own boss uh, to working for somebody, right? But there was a, there wasn't um, a, uh, a goal to this whole thing. I, I wanted mm -hmm. to learn more about it. I want to be, want to be more, you know, in it, neck deep into it. So, I mean, long story short, I, I spent uh, just under three years doing acquisitions for Sean Terry. And, uh, and I mean, I got exposed to so many seller appointments. I was able to practice everything that I was learning. At that point, I went back to, uh, to school and I was working on my second uh, master's degree in psychology. So I was doing a lot of things at the same time, but I was everything in my head was connecting, right? Everything in my head was, okay, this has a lot, psychology has a lot to do with sales. Uh, sales, uh, I mean, it's the, the backbone of having a good wholesaling business in place. Uh, and then you, you know, tie in business and my experience in building that other company and fine tuning processes and stuff like that. So it was all just kind of taking shape. Um, from that point forward, it's just like one thing kind of led to the other. I ended up, um, um, after I left uh, Sean's uh, or uh, Sean's company, I, I launched a brokerage. So I opened up a brokerage. I already had my real estate license at that point. Um, and then um, set up my, uh, I went back to doing wholesaling and then fixing and flipping and having that, which is Pulse Capital. Uh, so now I have Pulse Capital, Pulse Realty and Associates, and then CEO Pulse, which is my organizational psychology practice. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like a, a, a big rundown of how it all came together. But um, the uh, the brokerage would have not have uh, had happened if I wasn't doing wholesaling. 
uh, the opportunity just, you know, came about because we monetize leads, right? So now we have leads, we have people that we're bringing in. What do we do with those leads if they don't want right. to do a, a wholesale deal? We push right. them over to the retail side. Yeah. So, so like, like this little ecosystem of, of, of yeah, uh, real estate that's happening. Yeah. So, so they, they, uh, the thing I love most maybe about real estate is that uh, no day is ever exactly the same. And there are several opportunities within the opportunities, right? Oh, there's, yeah. there's a lot of different ways you can monetize this, this industry if you, if you have all of the disciplines pulled under one roof. Uh, yeah. So uh, if you could describe for the audience, uh, you said you cherry pick some, why would, what's the incentive or what are the reasons that you landed on, on the wholesaling side instead of the full execution side? Um, it's easier. Transactions are a lot faster. I mean, you can be in and out of a deal in two, three weeks, uh, meaning that you get it locked up and then you find a buyer for it. You push it, you clear title, and then you get paid. And, and, uh, if you know how to negotiate deals, right. I mean, you're talking big, big spreads. Um, I think our average right now, our average spread is around $32,000 per deal. Uh, which is, I mean, it's a good, healthy spread, right? We have a very specific way of negotiating deals and, and, and working it from both sides on the seller side and on the buyer side. Uh, and at the end of the day, like it still makes sense for the flip. Um, so I, I mean, I got to practice a lot of that, a lot of those closings and, and, and putting it together. So it just makes, um, you know, I'd rather make $30,000 in three weeks than maybe 45 in, in two months. Right. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things, uh, whenever we do have a deal, that's okay. That it's like a wholesale type of stuff. We don't do full fix and flip, you know, full gut jobs and remodel. It's not, it's not my wheelhouse. Um, we're, we're doing speed. So we, we go into deals for speed. We can come in and then rehab something in a couple of weeks and then put it out in the next couple of weeks and, and do a total whole time. Right now the market's fast. So we'll hold the property for two months, two and a half, and it's, it's gone. Right. Uh, but if, uh, if it's something like that, that's going to be relatively easy to do and, 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 and it makes sense, uh, the numbers make sense. Yeah, we'll absolutely do a wholesale on it or fix and flip it um, to ramp up the profits another thirty forty thousand dollars $40,000. And you're, are, are you focusing on like one typology, one specific type of uh, product that you're looking to negotiate these deals on? Or is it a wide wide variety no no we've done everything from raw land to mobile homes to single family uh you know multifam and, and you know if the numbers are are there uh, we have a pretty solid buyers list i've been building that list for years and and um it's responsive right so we when we get deals through the door i mean we're they, they move they usually they hardly ever linger uh, or we have to reach out to co-wholesalers and whatnot but uh we have a very a systematic approach of this uh displaying the deals and that helps out because we have um, um, set, uh, we have so not selected. What's the word? I'm trying to find the word. Uh, we have um, segmented. That's the word. We have segmented um, buyers, right? So we have buyers that are you know specific for land, and mm -hmm. you know some other you know want commercial, some other want you know just residential. So we break it down and and we'll do a good relationship building throughout you know, the, the process and whatnot and, and reach out to these people and push them. But yeah, if the numbers are there, we'll, yeah, we'll make it happen. So uh, at the end of the day, <clears throat> nothing works on the wholesaling side if you're not buying the deal right. So yeah, you make the money on the purchase and, and, and here, I mean, here's the thing, right? It, it's, um, you, you can have, again, you can have the, the best um, you know, system of the best CRM, the best, you know, whatever you want to you know, put together in your business. But, but if you don't have the skill set and the soft skills required uh, to, to apply that action and bring forth those results, nothing's going to happen. I mean, it, it's, it really comes down to that. So how are you uh, so accurately comping out such a wide variety of, of asset types? Mm -hmm. Um, we use a couple of different services. One, the, the one that we use in Maricopa County, we'll use the MLS. My brokerage is in Arizona. So we have access to, to the MLS. We use this as a backbone market. So we're buying properties. We're doing deals in Maricopa County, um, which is very competitive. Um, there's still a lot of opportunity out there. So, uh, for that stuff, we'll use our, our brokerage resources, uh, anything that's out because we'll do virtual as well. Uh, we'll do batch leads. 
uh, will comp properties using batch leads. We love that service. They have great data. Um, same stuff for skip tracing. Um, so I highly recommend that, uh, that service for that kind of stuff. So um, you're <clears throat> identifying the deals. You, you've broken out your leads similar to how we do it because um, someone that's looking to buy a, a one family fix and flip is not the same person that's looking at raw land. It's not the same person that's right. looking to buy a, a, a multi-million dollar shopping center. You're right. targeting your lists as uh, the typology fits. You're copying these things out through local resources and some third party sites. Are you buying anything out of state or is everything localized? No, out of state, we'll stick to wholesaling. We won't flip. Um, I'm not holding out of state either uh, yet. So it's it just, I have different things in the burner. I'm building a, a software right now for, for um, it's a full operating system for wholesaling. Uh, so I'm caught in that project and I have a couple other things going on. Uh, so outside we'll strictly, I mean, right now the model that we have is just push it. We'll assign the deal, double close on it, double escrows. So know, I, I, I don't know if there's a space I'm more excited for. We're also uh, developing proprietary software. Mm. I feel like that is, is, is the, the one place where there's absolutely, it feels like unlimited opportunity and insane growth opportunity. Absolutely. I think so, man. I, I, I think there's a, there, there's a lot of stuff out there, but what, this is what happens, right? This is what happens. A lot of tools that we use as investors, um, a lot of them are put together by, by coders, right? They're put together by, I mean, the code is done by coders, but um, the actual infrastructure, the flow, the, the model of the business, the model of the software is put together by somebody who knows code. Uh, they're, you know, these people are engineers. They, you know, they, they work well that way, but they haven't done the business. A lot of these nope. people have no idea, uh, you know, how a wholesale transaction works, how, you know, where the little gaps are going to be in, uh, how a fix and flip works uh, and where, you know, you're going to have deficiencies and you're going to have bottlenecks in the process. If you're sitting down and thinking theoretical about anything, right, you can write three books on that thing. Uh, just by the stuff that comes into your into your brain, right? Ideas, uh, but until you put it into practice and you're actually in the trench doing the work, that's what we, the real questions don't come up. And I think that's uh, it's one of the big things that are uh, uh, that we're lacking in the space of of technology, like in in real estate specifically, right? In, in uh, investments. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, my thing. I, it's not going to be a lead generation thing. I'm focusing on. Uh, operating system. I want uh, and I actually have it. I actually uh, I house I house the 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 model. I house it inside Podio. So I have a Podio set up, and it it really runs the the entirety of my business. Uh, so I'm taking that and doing a standalone software. But I it's uh, you have to do um, a lot of stuff. A lot of you know you have to be in it consistently to fine tune to be able to see how you can lean it out, how you can make it better and improve it. Right, and you you can't see that from if you're not in the business. So the, we're at in a really unique time where yeah. there are those of us that grew up with enough technology. Um, so we, we've got a good base, we understand it, but we've also been deal makers long enough where if your software does not fit into a deal makers workflow, it will not get used, period. Right. And they the people that are putting these it's crazy to me. We see all the time, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that are raised. And these programs are being built out by folks who wouldn't know a real estate deal if they tripped over it. And yeah. while on paper, it sounds great and it feels like it's a wonderful solution. When you sit down and you actually try and interface at the speed and the tone and tempo of the way we operate in the business, they don't work. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't translate. Um, so I, I see that quite a bit and, and what I'm, my, my, my background and, and especially because of uh, my psychology background, business psychology background is it's people in systems, right? It's hiring the right, you know, the right butts in the right seats and then um, assigning the right tasks and, and knowing how to hire. So putting all of that stuff together in an operating system that runs the business. Uh, it, I mean, to me, it's, it's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. Yeah. We have CRMs. They usually you have you'll have a CRM that's not really a CRM. It's like a lead generation thing, uh, or, or it's you know a transaction coordination thing or something like that. But it's not really a um, an operating system for the business. It's a segmented tool. Um, so what I'm working on is is 
it's the whole thing. I'm, I'm selling the machine. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So as you're scaling <clears throat> now this, this wholesale operation, the demands for capital start to skyrocket, right? So mm -hmm. are you taking in outside? Are you doing raises or how are you backstopping the increased flow? No, actually, we have a pretty uh, controlled uh, marketing budget. And um, the, the way that it works, and I, I don't know if, if you're okay with this, I can break it down, but I, I break yeah. the business down in six sections. So um, I have a, a philosophy, I call it the less business, more profits uh, philosophy, but less as in lean, effective, strategic, and simple, right? So you have, you have um, um, lean processes, uh, strategic vision, um, effective um, models. And, and at the end of the day, you have, you know, easy to understand accountability. So it just encompasses everything. Uh, less business, more profits, lean effects, strategic and simple. And what happens when you have a business that's running like that, uh, you'll recognize the bottlenecks. You'll recognize, okay, where am I getting stuck? Where am I having redundancies? Where am I spending money that I'm, uh, I'm not supposed to be spending? Uh, we track, okay, I mean, we have KPI galore. You know, we have KPI parties every Tuesday. Uh, so we track all the metrics and, and the navigators and the KPIs of the business of what happened with this particular marketing campaign. Are we getting a good ROI? Um, and we follow, you know, scorecards and, and, and we're very adamant about having a systematic approach to all that. Uh, but it, uh, it helps in the overhead. Now, we're putting money out there for marketing. And again, uh, you make the money when you're, when you're locking the deal, right? So we want to make sure that we have um, the, that the people who are trained to do the, uh, the negotiation per se, um, they are, that's what they're doing. They're not cold calling. They're not, you know, they're focused on that, on that particular role. One thing that I see is, is um, people usually want to, you know, I want to scale, quote unquote scale, right? Um, I want to get bigger. I want to hire. I need to bring people in and they'll have somebody who's really good in acquisitions and then they'll have them cold call for eight hours. Uh, and that's, I mean, you're breaking uh, the, the, hit, the behavioral strengths of that, of that um, employee or that team member. They're being broken down with something that it's not their highest and best. So to get around that and really optimize the, uh, the, um, minimize the overhead and optimize the, the efficiencies are, uh, I break it down like this. So we have a sourcing, right? We have a sourcing stage, stage one of the business. You start sourcing uh, the leads. That's all it is, it's sourcing. It's not pre-qualifying, it's not negotiating, none of that. Um, there's specific um, people that fit into that role. You have cold callers. Um, if you're doing PPC kind of stuff, you have you know SMS, you're sourcing, but we keep it separate from lead gen and, and acquisitions because there's a lot of um, turnover. Uh, people switch cold callers, I mean, every other Sunday. It's just the reality of the business, right? You're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna have the same quality team member in a cold caller than you are somebody who's just an absolute assassin when it comes to locking deals and negotiating. It's just not the same behavioral strengths. We're, not, we're wired differently for each one of those roles. So you have to find the right person for each one of those. So we source at stage one. Stage two, <clears throat> I have lead managers. And she'll pre-qualify. So she'll go through, uh, you know, condition, motivation, timeline, and, and the price of the property, pre-qualify. Um, and if this turns into a prospect, then it gets sent over to my acquisitions reps. Um, so my, my role, I want to see enough prospects uh, on the acquisition reps um, desk, right? I want to see them inside, inside our operating system. We have a number. I want to make sure they have enough people they talk to. If they don't have enough people that they can talk to because we have this process, I go back, okay, and um, I can identify what's happening. Like, is it uh, because we're not converting right? Are we not pre-qualifying right? Does a lead manager have enough leads to pre-qualify? If they do, then it's a conversion problem, right? If they don't, it's a sourcing problem. And I can backtrack it and really like pinpoint the origin of it and, and get rid of those bottlenecks. So uh, stage three is it's acquisitions. Uh, when we make offers, we find multiple ways of monetizing on leads. We make a wholesale offer. Uh, we'll move on to an option offer if that doesn't work. Uh, if it doesn't work, we'll do creative financing. If that doesn't work, we'll push it over to the brokerage side, right? So we have multiple ways of being the solution for that seller. Uh, and at this point, the seller has already had two conversations, one with the cold caller and then one with my lead manager for the pre-qualification process. So they're I mean, they're not all the way there, but you know what I mean? There's something that we can have a conversation about. And it keeps my acquisition team rolling uh, on follow-ups, on new leads, on prospects. If that number drops, 
uh, I know that I got to ramp up marketing or fine tune the conversion. One of the two, it's simple, right? When you have a system in place. Now, if I had a hundred thousand dollars and I was going to throw it all into marketing, yeah, you're going to get a bunch of leads, but where are your bottlenecks? Like that's where a lot of people miss the, uh, miss the mark. Right. Um, yeah, I'm getting a ton of leads. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know if they're pre-qualified. I don't know what's happening you know, to them as the process goes. So first three stages, we do that. The fourth one is going to be Dispo. Uh, we, come, we come in and then we have a couple of different strategies on the Dispo side to maximize the, the, the profits, the assignment fees. Um, and then we get paid right after the Dispo stage. Most businesses stop there. Uh, we actually have a, a stage five, which is uh, measuring and stage six, which is improving. Every single deal, we'll do, a, we'll do a breakdown or the team does a breakdown. Okay, what happened in this deal? We closed on it and our revenue was $32,000. Uh, was that, you know, what if? What if we have done this, had done this on, on that deal? Could we have taken 40? Uh, what if we had marketed this way? Could we have, you know, and, and new SOPs come out of that, new processes. Uh, you come in, you adopt them if they make sense, and then you'd run them to the, to the, next, um, to the next deal, and that's the improving. So we have those six stages, boom, 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 boom. Sourcing, converting, pre-qualifying, uh, acquisitions, dispo, measuring, and improving. That same process on every single one of the deals uh, builds a, a machine. And anytime something is a little off, you can go back um, and then um, fine-tune you know, where the bottlenecks are. Uh, it really keeps the overhead low. <laughs> I don't well, know what I, else to tell you. <laughs> I have to say uh, I'm blown away by, by your process. So the hardest thing to do is scale. And we find over and over and over, I am number one guilty of this. Uh, in the past, we have spent so much time working in the business that we're not working on the business. Yeah. You have put immense energy on working on the business as opposed to in the business. And by that, I mean, when you're, you're quickly rattling through this process and, and KPIs, key performance indicators, and you're looking at... Uh, if there's a drop in leads, it's not just go throw a bunch of money at marketing, which specific types of leads was the fallout? Why was the fallout? Uh, all of these incremental steps incredibly optimize the bottom line and make you incredibly efficient. How the hell did you get to a point where you were able to graduate from being in the business to on the business so quickly? Uh, well, it wasn't, it wasn't that quickly, um, but I brought in uh, Renee. He's my uh, director of operations. Uh, he handles Dispo and I brought him in a couple of years ago. So I started, uh, I, I never, I never delegate anything that, uh, that uh, I don't, I don't want to say I'm an expert on, but I don't at least know enough about it to be dangerous in it. Uh, so I, I have to go through the process and, um, one, th one thing that I'm really good at is, is documenting everything. Uh, as I'm doing things, as I'm doing new things, okay, this is how I did it. Uh, and I, I'll write it down. I'll do a quick little video about, you know, about whatever it is that I'm doing. I can come back and now it's training material, right? But more importantly, you come back and then you revisit what you're doing. Um, so it's, it's having an active uh, learning mentality and that curiosity. Okay, what if? Okay, what if instead of uh, asking for EMD of, of $5,000, what if I do, I don't know, $3,000 EMD and a shorter close of escrow? Uh, you know, does that improve my you know, length of a deal? You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and just playing with it, fine tuning it. So again, something happens, something you know, works. You take it, you adopt it, and then you drop it into your SOPs, your, your standard operating procedures, so your, your business model. Uh, but having a good, uh, a good process in, uh, in, in terms of, of protocols and what to do, I, I mean, that really does it. It's going to take you 15, 20 minutes extra to record a video um, when you're doing something, when you're going through a deal, when you're filling out a contract to send it out to a seller. So if, uh, if you're putting it, Here's the thing, the hustle, it's going to get us to, to uh, from point A to point B, right? But hustle is its season. It's not, it's not a business strategy. Uh, it, it's, it's not sustainable. You're going to burn out. If you're always in that hustle state, uh, you're always trying to figure things out, right? It's, hustle is it's, it's connected with, with figuring things out and kind of shooting from the hip. I'm hustling through things. I'm trying to find the next deal. I don't know where, but I'm going to hustle so I can get it. And there's this glorified sense of, of you know, righteousness of, you know, from living in the hustle. 
which is all fine and dandy for the first couple of years. Why? Because we need that vibe. We need that traction. We need that energy. We need that, you know, that uh, thing to just propel us and push us to, you know, forward. Right. So having a hustle, um, a mentality is a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's not sustainable. Uh, soon enough, you have to jump into something that's going to set up your systems. The freedom really is in the systems. It's really cool when you're in Costa Rica and you're looking at a deal that just closed, it's $40,000, $42,000 just went into your account. Um, you can't do that without systems. You can't do that without a team that knows what they're doing and that they can take uh, responsibility for what and owning you know, the results, right? Um, you may have the best, you know, kind-hearted people in your team, but if, if there's no fundamental um, uh, process that they can follow, and, and, you know, step one, step two in a linear type of way, you're going to lose them. Why? Because people get confused. People do not uh, operate well, you know, in, in, in places where there's confusion. There's, you can scale a system, a process, or you can scale chaos. I mean, it really comes down to that. Without a doubt, uh, you know, something you touched on earlier. Uh, also, again, I give you a lot of credit for it because typically people don't, don't understand this until it's, it's much further down the line and they've done a lot of damage in their organization. We call it operating in the gift. Um, you, you referenced it in the context of not taking a deal maker that is a fine tuned machine, right? A deal maker is a special breed and dropping them into eight hour cold calling sessions every day. Yeah. Um, is this stuff that you learned through the, psych the, the psychology classes and the degree that you took or where did all of this start to, to weave its way in? Yeah. So I've been, I've been playing with, uh, with this. Well, I mean, some people like video games. I like, I like psychology. And uh, I, I dove into uh, disc assessments and profiles very early on. I mean, I'm talking about maybe 2009. That's when I kind of got exposed to that. Um, and, and we're all algorithms. Psychologically, we're algorithms, right? Uh, we are wired uh, in, in certain ways. So there's, we have natural tendencies. We have natural, um, natural cycle, um, natural behavioral strengths that we're just kind of, you know, come out of the womb, out of the box. We're just wired that uh, with those. Now to that, you add on learned behaviors, you add on, you know, different skill sets, you add on exposure, you have, you know, your parents had tenacity, you borrowed tenacity, right? Um, but we're, we're going to be naturally wired for something. And uh, when you're, when you're able to hire based on, on the strengths of what the role needs here, here's one thing that happens. And, and, um, let me know what you think about this, but the, here's one thing uh, that happens. People will do, for example, a personality assessment for hiring, right? And they're like, oh, right, cool. I like this. I like this person, but they'll do the personality for, um, they'll hire for the, um, for, for the person, as opposed to the, the, uh, the qualifications of the actual role. Uh, meaning if you have somebody who's an introvert, who's very, uh, you know, they're not social. They, they like, you know, to have that steady, you know, slower, more controlled, more predictable space to operate in. Mm -hmm. You can't put them as an acquisitions rep because that's highly volatile. You're out there all the time. You're engaging with people. It's a people business. It doesn't mean that they can't do it. It doesn't mean that they can't do it. Now, here's the difference. Uh, all it means is that you're going to get burned out. You're going to get tired a lot faster. Uh, for example, um, I'm good with spreadsheets. I, I'm like, uh, I am really good at creating the fancy ones with the, you know, the graphics and then doing all kinds of tricks. I've just been working on spreadsheets forever, but I know that I can only handle spreadsheets for maybe two hours at a time. Um, and then I'm just, I'm fed up. I was like, oh, the hell with this. I need a break, right? Because I'm adapting my behavioral style to the analytical side uh, and it's not my natural strength. So um, on the opposite side, you know, the, the same is true for somebody who's in acquisitions. If you're familiar with the disc assessment, you're looking for like your ideal acquisitions rep is going to be uh, somebody who's a high driver uh, and has a, a good high secondary um, um, influencer uh, uh, profile or influential profile. So a DI is it's kind of like the the uh, the mold for acquisitions hiring. Uh, your profile is different for lead management. Uh, your profile is going to be different for dispositions. You don't need the same behavioral traits or strengths, right? So if you're able to kind of see that and hire based off of that, and then to that, you add, um, you know, attitude and you can train for, for skill when they already have that, uh, that wiring. Uh, I mean, things just, you know, flow better. Uh, the attrition that I have is really, I mean, I, 
we don't have attrition <laughs> in the in the business. I mean, it's we have people that uh, come in um, and they stay. They stay for a long period of time. It, it's just attrition drops. So I, doing, I, I started doing the same thing in the transportation business. And um, just to kind of paint a picture, usually the attrition, uh, the average attrition rate, meaning somebody quits, uh, comes in and quits uh, after three months in that industry as a driver, just driving all day long, people in wheelchairs. Uh, so three months, um, my attrition rate was three years. That's a retention. That's how long people stayed. But I was hiring based off of, you know, those uh, strengths. Okay, this person fits this role. So are you doing the, those assessments pro D's on the way in, or are you doing this on your own? Who's evaluating? Cause that's a hell of a skill set. Who's I, doing that evaluation? I, I do. Um, I do. So I built um, in the, in the operating system that I have uh, for my company, it's, I built a just hiring um, applications, right. And there there's questions in there. There's short brief questionnaires that give me highlights of what, you know, these people are. Um, and I get an idea of that. And then I have, you know, a couple of other hiring questions in there that are, I mean, they're important just to know information and then they cross, you're almost like fact checking some of the stuff they're saying uh, as you're hiring them. So that, uh, that tells you quite a bit. Uh, so we do that within um, also on the, um, but each one of the roles, like, for example, we have the roles are defined uh, in, in the coaching program that I have, the roles are defined. Uh, so we know what to look for. We know to, uh, where to go get the test or the assessments from if you don't, if you're not the person that can do it on the fly. Um, you know, that's fine. There's still assessments that can give you a good insight of, of where they're at. Now, the coaching program that you've put together, is that specific to wholesaling or is it for other business opportunities as well? No, it's specific to wholesaling. Um, however, the structure works. So once you learn the, uh, the uh, we focus on wholesaling, you know, getting to that first deal and then ramping up from there, different stages of business, um, that sort of thing, right? So um, we focus on, on the how, how to get the deal in. It's all, it's all instruction. It's pragmatic information, step one, two, and three. It's very linear. So do this and now do this, now do this. Now there's no ambiguities. Uh, it goes, it's a, it's a process, right? Um, that when you have that process down, you can take the same framework and I have that same framework and I'm running my brokerage with it. Uh, I run, you know, the fix and Filippo operations we have, you know, we run it the same way with it. Uh, it's just, again, you have this business model in place and you shift a couple of things, but when you already know how to think, um, like an entrepreneur, instead of a hustler, uh, you wire things differently. You wire and things better. And now in your course, you're offering all of these different steps and the infrastructure and how to do all of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we break it down. I mean, we get really detailed on, on like individual businesses and people, uh, especially, I mean, not everybody's ready to hire right out of the gate, uh, but the time comes and the time comes really, really fast. So it's important to know how to do it uh, when, you get, you know, when you get ready for it. And that's what we do, we break it all down. So everything's laid out, but we also have um, uh, group coaching calls every single week and we break down scenarios and... And uh, believe it or not, we tackle uh, a lot of the, uh, the psychology and the mindset on the, on the real estate training <laughs> calls. Oh, I, I, I believe it. I have to tell you, uh, Raphael, I'm very impressed uh, at the operation that you've put together and how pragmatic you've been in, in building it step by step. I know how difficult it is. Um, and I really give you a lot of credit um, by far and away. People talk about mindset coaching and people talk about the buzzwords, but to yeah. see it in practice at this level is, is pretty damn impressive, man. You should really be proud of what you put together. I think it's amazing. Where do, where do folks find out more information? Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, so I'm pretty active on Instagram. Somebody wants to shoot me a message, um, uh, DM or whatever, Rafael Cortez, CEO, um, that's my handle. And you can find me everywhere as Rafael Cortez, CEO. Uh, YouTube, I post a lot of content on YouTube. I have post, a podcast on entrepreneurship, uh, series on wholesaling, uh, where I break it all down. I mean, I just give strategies and tactics on, on how to do real estate um, uh, wholesaling. And um, yeah, I do a lot of videos on, on mindset and just entrepreneurial principles as well. Uh, that's wow. a YouTube channel, yeah. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm real impressed and, and that doesn't happen very often. You've really got this on lock, man. Congratulations on, on the success. I'm excited to see where you go next and, uh, we'll certainly be in touch. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you having me and then give me the opportunity to uh, come and uh, talk to your audience. It's been a pleasure. Uh, yeah. I appreciate the time. Uh, as always, everybody out there, please stay safe. Mm -hmm.